your host Mona. Today I'm really excited to host a very good friend of mine. You know him as a cinematographer and a poet. Welcome next to the show. It's a pleasure. Man, you know what's up? Busy boy. Qualifying sa Uganda. So come, so come, so come. Pemka freestyle now. Akachi. You're a rapper, man. They said I'm a rapper, but they didn't specify what I rap. Who said? Um, the people, but uh, well, well, but, but I, you didn't come out to deny yeah, it. I okay, so let's, still a rapper. let's rap away. You're a poet, so but let's rap poet gifts. away. I rap gifts, actually. You rap gifts, yeah. Yeah, in this case, you're not rapping any gifts. So, can we can you just come on? Like, can can we get over with this? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not good with freestyles anymore, but I can still flow, yeah, maybe. Okay. If I was trying to ask myself why, I slow the tears of all of my eyes whenever I cry. When I see the kids in the streets without a smile, and more question that I ask is, how do they survive? Cause survival for the fetus is what rules the street saying. Day and night, these young lads go hungry. They aren't told stories when the dark befalls them, cause when the rain falls down, show us them like the dogs. Yeah, you know, party too. Yeah, you know, party too. I only, <laughs> I only understood one word, smile. That is all. The Thank other you. stuff you're gonna have to tell you, me. You're not supposed to. <laughs> yeah, that's well, you it. walked in limping. Well, what's up? Were you getting some kind of character? I was playing what's soccer. Up? I had a hope that uh, I would still help Uganda qualify for the World Cup, but I just told <laughs> the tournament on. is on. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ness, mm -hmm. we know this Ness, and we love this Ness. We love your films. We follow you, we like all your comments, and we like everything that we know about you. Tell me, would we like Ness 15 years ago? It depends on who meets me and where they meet me, but I really doubt 80% of the people that really like me now would like me 15 years ago. What happened when you say a, a, a lot of people who like you today might not have liked you 15 years ago? What happened? 15 years ago, I was a totally different person from the person I am today. I'd actually backdate it to about 16 years ago because 15 years ago I was on my way to transformation and stuff. But 16 years ago I was defined by the life I lived, by the place I lived. Which I is? grew up in uh, the slums of Naguru. When I talk of Naguru, I don't mean Naguru Hill and stuff. Wow. I'm talking of Naguru go down Bank Village near Kasenke. That's where I grew up from. And uh, at the time I grew up there, it was a den of crime. And uh, it it wasn't really hard for you to join in because you had someone to mentor you into that. And uh, I should say 15 years ago, today you would call me a cinematographer, you'd call me a spoken word artist, you would name me any of those. Yeah. 15 years ago, you'd call me a thief, um, you'd call me a robber, you'd, uh, all the sorts of tags they give to those kids. And it's not just a tag, it comes with the actions. Yeah. yeah. We learned how to break into shops when we were still very young. We learned how to rob people when we were still very young. And um, in the place I grew up, it wasn't a story. It, it was nothing shocking when you went to school and came back in the evening and they told you, ah, and that's and, your and friend. Your like, boy, yeah. yeah, like you went to school in the morning, you literally left him home doing dishes or something. Mm. And you're like, what happened? He was caught stealing, he was caught doing this and that. And, um, but most of it happened in my teenage, when I was in boarding school. Each time my mom came on VD, at least there was someone that was gone. There is a friend of mine who was literally killed the day before VD. He was called Siniku. He was shot at uh, around ShopRite, Logogo. It's the reason that's why they put the street lights at Shop uh, ShopRite, Logogo, because it really used to be dark. And wow. so, I mean, I was defined by that life. But yeah, they say change is a personal decision you make. I think I made the decision. And, and, and you made the decision to change. Yeah. And how, how has that decision impacted your life today? Um, I think I'm who I am. I tell the stories I do tell from the perspective of what I know, what I experienced, what I witnessed growing up. Um, in 2012, I was at a shop in Naguru. And I saw a very young kid, about seven years old. He was doing what I did when I was seven. And he was doing that to you? No, I was there watching. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I would have punched the audience. <laughs> I <wouldn't. laughs> but I was at a shop, and they came in a group of three. Mm. 
at first I also thought they were buying something, but I knew what we used to do. So there is this uh, the butanda they put outside the shop that yeah. have bread and stuff. Yeah. So what they would do is two of them go to the shop, and one of them keeps keeping the shopkeeper busy. Yeah, uh, busy send me yeah. that stuff. No, I think it's the other one. Uh, how much then is this? Exactly. Uh, yeah. So as the shopkeeper is facing the other side, there is one the other side picking the bread. The bread, yeah. Yeah, so I got beaten for that on a couple of occasions. So <laughs> I saw the path this kid was taking. To me, he wasn't a thief. And neither did I think he was doing wrong. Okay, yeah. the action was wrong, but yeah. he was trying to survive. Survive, yeah. Exactly. So society has really put tags on kids that make it hard for them to transform. And that's how I came up with my organization, the Get A Film Project. Mm. I didn't have money yeah. to give them. I didn't have anything. But the only thing I had was a skill in film and art. By the time I was still doing my degree in art at mm. MOOC. So I decided to dedicate my Saturdays to teach these kids, keep them busy and show them something better. And um, five years down the road, it's a good thing we've done. And why do you do what you do? Um, every single person on earth has a story to tell and your story is different from the other person's story is different True. from the other person's story yeah. and most of our stories come from the experiences we go through um, I would love to give everyone a platform to share their experience because your experience yesterday is what someone is going through today and someone else will go through tomorrow exactly yeah, yeah. And where you are today is someone's future, like they really want to be like you in mm -hmm. a way. So it's more of s trying to set role models that don't fit the stereotype of the ghetto kind of thing. Uh, personally, I was a thief. Yeah, I, I don't deny that. And it's not something I say with pride, yeah. but it's something I say so that probably there is a kid that is out there and thinks they've done the worst. But no, I was a thief. But the most fulfilling thing was there is a day my mom was really bedridden, like bedridden. We didn't have nothing, like nothing, totally nothing. And I remember I'd promised myself I'm not going to break into any other shop again. And I looked at the wire cars, the cars we used to make out of wire. Kids nowadays yeah. don't know yeah, those. They don't know. So I made my car and I sold it for 200 shillings, and I bought my mom Panado. I remember her looking at me and crying. That was the most fulfilling thing for me. And it got me to one thing. I think if we empowered these kids, it, it's all about empowering the kids. If I can empower the kid today, I'll change their mindset tomorrow, you get. Mm. So why I do what I do is I target the kids. I target the young kids. The younger people, so that I could change their today, so that they change someone's tomorrow. And it's all based of experiences that I went through. Mm. Yeah. And, and growing up around crime, uh, should we blame it all? Um, should we blame it all um, on? Uh, should we blame it on that kid? Um, no. I really think that's where society gets it wrong. Society chooses to judge the kid and not look at the situation. If we go back, I was born to a rich family, I would say. And oh. we had it all. I went to the best school till I was about six when my parents broke up. And life just took a turn a in ton. about yeah. a year. And we went from having four taxis and having all this stuff to ending up in an unfinished building in Naguru in a rainy season where when it rained, basically your floor was all muddy and stuff, and we had to readjust. It got to a point where the only source of water for you to drink was a septic tank from someone. Whoa. And what we used to do, yeah, okay, it wasn't that you would go into the septic <laughs> tank, but the septic tank mm. had an outlet into the place was swampy, yeah. into the swamp. 
So that water that would leak out and stuff, you guys would fetch that water, put it in the basin under the sun, and then give it like an hour for the residue to settle down. Then you scoop out the upper part. And you're going to drink that water unboiled because there's mm. no money for charcoal, there's no money for this and that. And life pushes you to a corner. And the only thing you see is what everybody's doing around you. Yeah. If the people around you are probably carpenters and stuff, you're going to seek a way out in carpentry. Yes. But if the boys around you are actually doing crime, and when I was a kid, they were doing good mm. because they buy the latest T-shirts, they, they buy shoes, they do all this stuff. You're like, you know what, probably I could also try my luck. Mm. And society hasn't put up structures that enable these kids empower themselves. If we did that, then I doubt these kids would look at crime as an alternative. I have kids that come to my organization over the weekends and you look at the kid, he's really weak and all that stuff, and you ask him what's wrong and says he hasn't eaten in two days. But his friends are actually in Nakawa robbing people. Mm. You get. But he chooses to do this because he sees where it's gotten you. And funny thing is when I started up the organization, no parent wanted their kids to come. Why? They knew my story. Yeah. And they thought I was trying to recruit their kids into that. <laughs> but it's after a long period of time that they saw, okay, probably yeah. I'm trying to make it better. Mm. So when their parents tell them about my story and they see me, probably they see me on TV, probably they read me in the newspapers and stuff, to them, you've made it in life and they want to be that person. Mm -hmm. So setting up role models in the ghetto is one thing that will help the kids grow. Not actually throwing the kids in jail, not beating them up, not killing them, because there's mob justice and it's real. Yeah. And it's real indeed. Nest in the building, everybody will be back with more. Stay tuned. <laughs> Everybody, we are back with Ness <laughs> in the building. Ness, how do the people look at you now, knowing your past? I haven't let my past define me, which means I haven't let people define me. But people will always look at you the way they want to. Um, I remember in uh, 1998 when uh, I lost my kid brother and um, they buried my school uniforms instead of him. Like, it was just a young baby. And the next day my mom finds the baby in a suitcase after we'd buried the previous day. And there was all these fracas. And um, I was told from school to go back home before the school ended. And I found so many media houses, the radio stations and stuff. By the time there were very few TV stations, of course. But I remembered one of the TV personalities who was a very prominent reporter at the time, the name I wouldn't mention, mm. said one thing when I was about to get home because our home was in a valley. And when we were moving down, one of the ladies said, So this guy t tells his cameraman, young woman with quiet home says, Whoa. Yeah. And they made a conclusion. It was hard for us. My sister dropped out of school. My kid bro dropped out of school for like a year because we're being bullied and stuff. I became violent. I started fighting. Wow. But one time the teacher sat me down and told me that I was at Nagur Infant Primary School. I'm so proud of that school because mm -hmm. he's called Mr. Moviru, Chambiru. He told me the same cameras that are actually doing this to you are the same cameras you should work hard to go in front of and change the whole story. Great. So my entire journey has been trying to change that story. But I realized in the beginning it was me working hard to get there and change my story in front of these cameras. But when I grew up, I realized it's not just my story. It's a story of thousands of ghetto that, kids, yes, not in Nanguru. Yes. Anyway, it's very many people going through this right now. Mm. And if I'm shy to speak about that part of my life, because I can't only speak about that incident and not talk about who I was. So if I'm shy talking about what I did, 
then I'm denying a person an opportunity to feel like they can also they can move also out of that situation. Out, yes. And I felt like rap, spoken word, and film were the only way I could express that. And that's why I chose those mediums. And, and how has rap or hip hop influenced most of the films that you have done? Hip hop has been of great influence. That's why my first two short films were spoken word pieces. We live in the most educated generation that there ever was. The era led by technology and innovation. The most connected and social generation. Then why do we feel like we fall short of life's expectations barely before life kicks off? Maybe we missed something. It's the frustration of a 17-year-old rapper that feels so unappreciated after rewriting her verse five times and feeling like it's the end of the road for her. Or maybe a 28-year-old lawyer whose sole ambition is winning case after case, hoping she'll one day prosecute at the Hague but just lost two cases in a row and wondering if she chose her wrong career. A 20-year-old model whose dream has been featuring in a fashion week in Paris but just got turned down at five auditions. A boxer, b-boy, athlete, pastor, farmer or a mountain climber that walked two weeks to the top of the mountain just to take a selfie for Facebook, only to check on our letter to no likes or maybe that one constellation comment that reads this is photoshop um i'm a proud son of the bonfire uganda yay ugly mc uh he gave me the confidence as a very uh, shy ugly. kid <laughs> and i remember the first time i went there i failed to perform the next time then ugly came to me and told me in his tough voice he's like it's guys like you that make the ghetto look bad that is ugly like, yeah <laughs> and in his strong voice and i was like okay so i'm going to make the ghetto look good and i started expressing myself i used to write letters to my unborn son when i was about 14 because i didn't think i would live to the age of 20. i had a drug problem i had esteem issues i didn't love myself i hated my dad i hated my life so i knew one of these things would take away my life before i was 20. So I started writing those letters and later I started performing them as spoken word pieces and it was relieving. Yeah. It was relieving in a way. So I felt like hip hop and poetry gave me a sense of belonging and it's had great influence in what I do. When you look at the films I do, there is either the, extra, the soundtracks or whatever, the setup and everything, it's, it's all hip hop. Do you think spoken word can be a genre of film? Yeah, I think it can, but I would think it would be unrealistic for someone to sit around and listen to a spoken word artist do the same thing for one and a half hours. But with short films, I think it's already taken off. When I look at people like Prince E.A., Sully Brex, George the Poet, they're all doing short films of spoken word. I wouldn't probably call them spoken word short films, but they actually do regard them spoken word short films. And at some festivals that I've submitted, they've put poetry films. So they haven't yet put it as spoken word short films, but there is poetry films. Yeah. yeah. Great. So we'll be back with more of Ness. <laughs> So, you have worked with just one team and all the films that I've seen done by Ness, you have just one team that you have worked with. Why is that? Um, I believe in mentorship. Um, I do mentor kids. And uh, most of these, uh, when I started up the Get a Film project, I wanted to tell stories, but I, can't, I couldn't tell the story alone. And truth be told, I didn't even have the money to get a team together and stuff. So I began, I remember my very first team, I picked up on Friends. I got Roy, who had uh, just quit his job at MTN, the Roy, IT thing. Roy, our Roy? Roy, Roy Chintado. Uh, okay. Yeah. He was Hi, sitting Roy. home. And I told him, you know what, I'm going to shoot a film and I need someone to help on set. And he's like, yeah, I'm free. So I got him and took him and we started from there so i started building up a team 
uh, one thing I realized is loyalty is everything. And these guys were loyal. On that team, I would say some of them have gone up to do great things. Some will save your chizito. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> Bro, yeah. <laughs> like, lo lots of guys, the Malcolms. And I stuck with the same team because, one, they believed in me. Two, they understood me. And uh, I also wanted to see how much I could impact on them. But reason as to why it's taken me long to now do the next film is I got to a point where I felt, okay, now these guys can stand. These guys can do stuff on their own. And now I've been mentoring the second group of kids. So on my next film, it's a totally Different new. Different. Yeah. New. So that's what I want to do. And I have a teach one, each one policy. If I teach you something for free, don't sell it to someone. Teach them for free. Because at the end of the day, when you teach, you also learn at the same time. There are lots of things I've learned from people I've taught. And I also have lots of things I've taught people that taught me. So, yeah, I believe in working with the same crew because loyalty is everything. Fantastic. And before I let you go, Ness, I'd yeah. like for you to look into that camera and speak to the world, to all the people out there in five seconds. Yes, just five seconds. Go. Um, everybody is born with a story and we're all made of stories, past, present and future. It's important that you tell your story because no one will tell it better than you do. Don't wait for someone to tell your story. Pick up your smartphone, pick up whatever you have. Tell your story. That's it. Amen to that. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming through. I'm humbled. And that's all that we had for you today. Unfortunately, we have got to go. Do follow us and like our social media platforms for more updates and reviews on our film industry. For now, keep those cameras rolling. We're out.